I am not afraid to put my hand up and tell you all that I have failed more times than I care to admit. We failed when we built this thing that was incredibly accessible. We were contracted by a, a, an organization to build them an accessible custom video player. And we, part of the reason that we, we won that engagement was, was because of our experience with accessible video players. We had done many, many assessments of, of other people's video players, both custom ones and stock ones. And we, we had taken those things and we had done all kinds of testing and even done some usability testing with people with different disabilities. And we had turned that into what we felt was a, an absolute winning combination in terms of, of building this, this accessible video player. The, the company or the organization that we were building it for had a lot of uh, visually impaired folks that were their target market. They were delivering content directly for them. And so this was like a, a perfect opportunity for them to say, we need to have a, an incredibly accessible video player. And we looked at that project and we said, not only can we make it accessible, we're going to do it in phases. We're, we're going to be very agile in this. And we had set it up so that I think we were doing uh, testing with real people with disabilities, of, of many different disabilities, after every two or three sprints. So when we got to the point where we're like, hey, this is a good, this is a good uh, spot to check, we will, we will do that. And so we ran through usability testing. We did that two or three times uh, throughout the project. And it was, it was successful. We, had, we created uh, an accessible video player. Uh, if I, I abstract that a little bit and show you a little bit more, just kind of like the wireframe, one of the things that you might notice is missing. You, you can see there's you know, like the, the big giant play button in the middle. There's the timeline and the scrubber uh, along the bottom. We see the, the full screen button, a transcript button, a closed captioning button, uh, a mute and volume control, and then we have a, a play control. One of the things that we didn't have was a rewind or a fast forward button. One of the things that we had seen before was, was that often in a video player, there's a lot of controls. And that can make getting around and operating that video player a little bit more difficult. So we actually thought, well, if, since we're putting in an extra control for the transcript, most people don't have a, a transcript control as part of the video player. We, we thought that that was a, a good thing to do. Um, we thought, we're adding a button. Maybe if we make this so that it's really accessible and the timeline scrubber is super accessible, people won't need a fast forward and rewind button because they can get around the video using the, the timeline scrubber. So we had this, this idea and we thought it was, uh, was, was going to be uh, a ridiculously accessible video player and we're like, we've even taken some controls away, that's going to be better. Uh, and so we put it through its paces, we do lots of testing and technical testing and then we're getting ready for, for user testing. And we get feedback like this that says, I couldn't find a way to move ahead. I did try the slider, but it didn't appear to be adjustable. And we're like, hold the phone. We just finished testing this like three days before. That timeline scrubber, that slider is adjustable. We know that it's adjustable. But what we didn't take into account was that we, we kind of had this idea when we were testing that, and this is pretty common, you may have heard this before, but when we're testing with certain pieces of assistive technology like a screen reader, we will test with the current version and then maybe minus two, right? And so we had done that testing from a technical perspective, we felt pretty good about it. And it turns out when we were doing that usability testing, the person that, was, that had this particular issue that couldn't find a way to make that slider adjustable, they weren't getting any of the, announce, the announcements that this scrubber was adjustable because they were on a, a screen reader version that was four versions old. And so it didn't fall within our, our testing scope, and so we kind of completely missed that. And they just happened to be using an older version because that's the technology that they came to us with. So that was a, a, a little bit of a moment for us where we thought, oh, we, we've completely missed this. Uh, and, and this was, was uh, not really easy to take. Like, we're, we're an accessibility agency. Like, this is all we do, and then we're getting this kind of feedback from, from people with disabilities in the process of that usability testing. That was, that was tough, right? That was, as the leader of the company, I was like, ooh, that, that hurts. So we continue on, and we, we keep going through to, um, 
to, to take a look at this and we decide that we're going to get some other, uh, other people with different disabilities. So it's not just about screen reader users and we're working with, with people with low vision. And so one of the common things that happens for someone with low vision, uh, and there's lots of different reasons for this, but for someone that has low vision, we often get a limited view of the screen. Sometimes that's because of the physical characteristics of their vision. Sometimes it's because they need to use a magnifier to make the screen much bigger. And therefore, the, the part of the screen that they are looking at is like really tiny. That's not that the screen is tiny. It's just literally that's the only part that they can see. And so what I would like for you to do here is, is to just really quickly take a look at this. We're gonna, I'm going to highlight that that timeline scrubber, and I'm going to give you a very simple task that we created for this, this usability study. And that simple task was move the video to the 10 minute mark. Seems very innocuous, but watch what happens. And you can do this. And so I, I kind of expect all of you to look at the screen for this. As I limit the field of view that you have, and the rest of the stuff kind of is not really in your field of view. What happens when we say, move to the 10 minute mark of the video? <laughs> you don't know where 10 minutes is, right? So the feedback that we got was this. I can only see a small amount of the screen at a time. I couldn't see the time counter to the left of the slider. So I had to move the position dot uh, to the right, guess how far I should go, and then move all the way back over to the left to find the time, and then go and adjust again, and then go and check, and then go and adjust, and then go and check. Now, every one of you probably looks at this and you could, you could say, like, what could we do to solve that problem, right? There's a, there's a few different things that we could do. One of them, we could just take the number, whatever it is, and make it so that when we're dragging that, that scrubber along, we've got a, a, kind of like a copy or another version of the number uh, of the time right above or maybe right below the scrubber so that as we're moving along, it's, it's there in the field of view, right? So we made it really technically accessible, but we hadn't really considered the impact on, on people with low vision. So you know, there's a, a number of ways that we can solve this problem. One of the other ways that I wanted to solve the problem was to actually make it so that you could just tap or click on the time, and it becomes editable. And then you can just type in the number and hit enter, and then it'll automatically take you to that part of the video. Right? There's, there's lots of different ways that we could kind of solve uh, solve that problem. So ultimately, we got to the point where we were getting this feedback, and we're like, we need to go back, and we need to do some more work. We need to redesign, rethink things, and then, and then um, redevelop things as well, and let's, let's use that screen reader that was a little bit older. And so we go through that process, and we decide this time we, we will put in one with, a, with a, a set of fast forward and rewind buttons. And we actually got some great feedback the next time, and we did more of the technical testing. We still found that the feedback wasn't perfect, but it, it taught us something really important. The feedback we got was, it seems like the screen reader doesn't want to stay within that slider bar, but the buttons worked really well. So even though we thought we had made a perfectly accessible slider, there was something that was going on where the screen reader wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing or what the person was thinking it should do. We had this other mechanism of having the, the fast forward and rewind buttons there. It turns out as we talked with more people, we found that, that the idea to take the fast forward and rewind buttons away was actually a pretty bad one. Because for many people that had been um, you know, uh, blind since birth, they didn't see that timeline scrubber as like their primary tool. The buttons were their primary tool. They were, we had feedback that they were very used to a fast forward and rewind button on their cassette tapes or on their, um, on their VCRs. And so that paradigm was, was actually easier for them to understand than this thing, which is like a very visual slider. So that was all really, really good feedback. I just wish we'd had it earlier. And when I say that I failed and our team failed, it wasn't that we didn't create an accessible thing. It was still accessible. But there were a lot of things that we just didn't engage people with disabilities in early enough to get the kind of things that we needed, the kind of data and information that we needed, in order to be able to build the right thing. So we had built the thing right, but we hadn't built the right thing. 
And so that's a, a big piece of, of understanding what we're, we're actually talking about here. That failure isn't that we didn't make the thing accessible. It's that the process wasn't quite what it should have been. So we learned, we learned a lot from that. One of, them, one of the biggest lessons was that we made some really bad assumptions, right? We can take these, these rewind and fast forward buttons off and that people want those rewind and fast forward buttons gone. Um, we were really focused on, uh, on the screen reader side of things and maybe not enough in terms of the low vision side of things. So we ultimately learned, we delivered that accessible video player, but we didn't practice inclusive design. So when we talk about inclusive design, there's kind of two levels uh, and of inclusion. And so we think of inclus uh, inclusion in the product, and then there's inclusion in the process. So when you think of the words inclusive design, they can take on different meanings, right? Design can be both a noun and a verb, right? Design as in we created an inclusive design, right? But then there's also like inclusive design as in we are practicing, uh, no, that's, that's gonna end up with the same thing. Darn it. We, no, we practice inclusive design. That's still, darn it. Where do I wanna go with this? Think of design as a verb. That's all I need to say, right? So inclusive, inclusive design, design can be the noun and inclusive can be the adjective, or design can be the verb and inclusive can be the adverb, right? It's the thing that is, is telling us a little bit more about how we are, are, are designing things. So when we create an inclusive design, that usually means that we're not excluding people from using it. But one of the things that we don't necessarily have to do, we can, we can make a thing that is accessible and doesn't inc exclude people in lots of different ways. Right? We can make something in, uh, accessible by accident. This happens all the time. Right? We got lucky. Like literally we get lucky all the time. We can create a thing that we know is not accessible and then go back and fix it afterwards. Right? We can um, create a thing that's not accessible and then create another version of it that's accessible and we still have accessibility. We have still met that, uh, met that outcome. But it doesn't mean that we practiced inclusive design. Right? There is nothing that says in order to create an accessible thing, you need to talk to, interview, work with, or do anything else with someone with a disability. Right? You can do all of that on your own just based on things that you have, have learned and, and understood from, from past experiences or other people's past experiences. So when we're talking about inclusion in the process, that is all about how do we make sure that we are empowering people with disabilities to be part of the design process itself, right? Not just do their needs get reflected in this process, because we can do that just by using our, our minds, thinking about it. But how do we actually include people with disabilities in the design process itself? And that's a, a big part of what we're, what we're talking about today. The way to do that is to embrace this concept of diversity by default, right? Diversity by default, as in that is our new normal, that we have no normal, right? We embrace that diversity as the thing that we take into any design process. And, and a, a big piece of this comes from, and this is one of my favorite quotes uh, uh, ever. This is a, a gentleman, a South African gentleman. He said this in, in like the early 1990s. Him and another South African actually kind of converged on this, uh, and they both said it around the same time. Nothing about us without us, right? And the, the main idea behind that is, if you are creating something for me, I should have a reasonably meaningful way of participating in the creation of that thing, right? I should be represented in that somehow. And that's not just about creating a digital thing. That, that goes for like the digital things we create, but that even, even speaks to things like policy, right? One of, the, one of my favorite things, the next evolution of this, um, we have a, a new, uh, I'm Canadian, and, and I'm here from Ottawa, Canada. And one of the things that we have as of June 21st that was passed into law in Canada is the Accessible Canada Act. Um, and it is, is our government's effort to make sure that the rights and freedoms of people with disabilities are, are protected by, by law. And one of the phrases that our, our uh, honorable minister um, that was kind of in charge of it all said, she, she took this phrase and she actually said, let's just drop the about us. So the phrase that she has been using a lot, and I think I like this evolution, it's just nothing without us. 
right? Because we don't want people creating things about us anyway. We want to be, if we're truly integrated, people with disabilities are truly integrated into the process, then it's more like it's not about us anyway. So let's just make it nothing without us. And I, I, I kind of love that, uh, that phrasing. So if we keep that in mind and we think about how this, this works and, and what we need to do from, a, from an inclusive design perspective, we need to kind of reframe the way that we approach design. We've heard for many, many years things like we need to design for people that are not like us, right? We need to design for people that are not like us because we kind of live in a little bit of a bubble uh, in, in the tech world, right? We are not everybody out there is as nerdy as we are. I don't know if you knew this or not, but we're all nerds, right? Like we're like card carrying. This is what we do. We get into this. We live in the tech space for the most part. Some of you in here may not, right? So I don't mean to offend, but we, we maybe that's not offensive though, but yeah, I could dig myself out into another hole here. <laughs> but ultimately we, we hear this phrase a lot, right? Like we need to design for people that are not like us. And, and uh, the first time that I, I talked about this on stage, uh, I, I had some really interesting feedback from the audience, and, and um, I, I like to kind of flip this now. I actually want us to design for people like us, but we need to redefine what like us actually means, right? When we think of designing for people that are not like us, we think of people, and particularly in terms of disability, um, you know, we think, oh, and, and so let's say I don't have a disability, I'm designing things, then I'm going to design it for, for people like me out of like just natural instinct. What I want to do is get myself out of that mindset. It's not about for designing people that are not like us. It's like we're all people. If we redefine what like us means, that means that we understand that any one of us in this room could become disabled at any point at any time in our lives. Right? And by the time we get somewhere between 70 and 79, that's when it kind of becomes a coin toss as to whether or not it's going to be you. That's just reality, right? We're all getting older. This, this happens. I'm the, the number of photos that I have on my phone that are in my photos feed of <clears throat> medicine bottles because I can't read the instructions anymore, I can't read the dose, I take photos of them and then I blow it up so that I'm like, oh good, I'm not giving way too much medicine to my children that's going to make them sick, right? So I, I, that's just like, that's reality. So one of the things to keep in mind when we're saying, you know, we, we want to design for people not like us, I actually want us to design for people like us, but have a realization that our current situation right here, right now, is, is temporary, right? We, we, could, we could join the largest minority group at any time, right? That's, that's our reality. One in, one in seven people in the world have a disability. That means there's a good chance that, that many of us in here have a disability. Uh, I do, I, you, can't, you can't see it, uh, but I was uh, born with a club foot, and that means that my leg was straight and my toes were pointing over at that wall, and the bottom of my foot was kind of like pointing at that wall. Um, and so I had to have surgery and all kinds of things in my, my legs. If, so I posted a, a photo of my socks, uh, as I, I often do when I'm speaking at a conference. I'm like, hey, here's my socks. If you look in that picture, you can, I don't know why I do it, but I just do it. Um, but if you take a look in the picture, you can actually see the difference between my right leg and my left leg. My left leg is not nearly as strong as my right leg. And it didn't bother me for years, but now that I'm a little bit older, I'm starting to feel the, the flexibility in my ankle is not there anymore, and that causes pain in my ankle, which transfers to my knee, to my hip, and to my back. So I kinda gotta keep moving. I can't sit down for as long as I used to. I can't do 14 hours of coding anymore. I just can't. It's probably for the best anyway. But I, can't, I just can't do that anymore. So it's, it's having more of an impact on me um, as, I, as, I get, as I get older. So we want to redefine what like us actually means and understand that, that many of us in here have disabilities and we need to, to kind of think like, yeah, let's design for more like everybody. Uh, how many people have, uh, just raise your hands and say I, if you have seen this show, Halt and Catch Fire? Right, you didn't say I. Raise your hands and say I, if you have seen Halt and Catch Fire? 
I, because the lights are bright, I literally cannot see how many of you are holding up your hands, so when I hear it, I, I can tell. Um, if you have not seen this show, you, you have some work to do. This is like your next binge, uh, binge watch. Uh, it's, it, it's actually really, I find, found it very interesting because it's set in the, in the early 80s and it's kind of like the rise of, of the modern computer industry. And, and so these are, you know, the Silicon Valley startup and they are, they're basically getting in and, and launching the computer world. <clears throat> and there's this really interesting scene. This is Cameron. Uh, she is a brilliant programmer uh, back, back in that day, and she creates computer games. And, and um, it, computer games is kind of like her second thing that she does. So at this point, she's just working on the computer in general, trying to, to develop software for it. And she's, in this scene, she's talking with John Bosworth, and Bos is like executive at the company. Uh, and so this, this is one of my favorite scenes because it really kind of helps you think a little bit differently about who we're actually building things for. What was that dust up in the bullpen this afternoon? Uh, and, uh, it's a long story. Yeah, well, I got nothing but time. Clark, huh? Gordon is good. Mm. He's really good. Uh -huh. But Gordon wants to build a computer that'll impress all the other people who build computers. I want to build something for people who never thought they'd want a computer, who don't know anything about them. I want to build a computer for you. Now, Boz actually gets kind of offended at that. He's like, hey, come on, I know what I'm doing here. Like, what? But I love this, this idea that Gordon, Gordon is one of like the, the, the leads here, and he is like, like full-on nerd and going right at it. Like, he wants to build a computer, and you saw, saw her phrase, right, or heard her phrase. Gordon wants to build a computer that will impress other people that build computers. And Cameron wants to build a computer for people that never even thought they wanted a computer. And I kind of feel sometimes like that's what our industry has kind of become. Like we are building tool chains and tool sets and all kinds of, of complexity because we want, and I'm not saying that this is like, this is happening everywhere, but I sometimes feel like the industry, we are building things to impress other people in our industry rather than creating things that are actually helping people that are not in our, in our industry. And so I remembered this, I remember the first time I watched Halt and Catch Fire, I saw this and I was like, I have to capture that line because that, it's, it's really kind of critical, thinking about who we're building for and designing for. So one of the things when we're, when we're including people with disabilities in the process, if we look at this um, generic, kind of process and look and say like this is this is project x and it it goes from like an initial project concept some user research design iteration development and implementation validation and launch then we've got some iterative cycles in there because that circular arrow is like the universal sign for iteration don't look at this as a as a um, as like a whole process, this could be like, this could just be like one sprint, right? Or maybe we're doing something like this in one sprint or a couple of sprints, it's an epic, whatever it is. Uh, ultimately, what we're doing very often right now is we are testing with people with disabilities, right? And we're doing that kind of over here at this validation and launch stage, right? This is, this is very, very typical. In fact, in most cases, if you're doing this right now and doing usability testing, uh, either at the end of a project before launch or you're doing it at the end of a sprint or at the end of a few sprints or at the end of an iteration, whatever it is, if you're doing that and testing with people with disabilities there, you're already ahead of probably most of your competition because most people aren't doing this at all. But here's what we're saying when we do this. We are saying, we came up with a design, we built a thing, and now we want you to tell us whether we did it right or not. That is very different than incorporating people with disabilities into the beginning of the process. And when we talk about shift left, right, people keep talking about shifting left. And it's not about that being like, um, you know, any specific spot. It's really about like, can we do this earlier in the process? 
right? It's not about like it happens, has to happen at this time. It's just about like make it earlier, find a way to make it earlier, incorporate people with disabilities earlier, whatever it is. So that's what kind of shift left means to me. When we take, take people with disabilities and, and incorporate them into the process earlier, then what we're doing is saying, we want you to design with us, we want your ideas, because it's not just our ideas and our execution that is valid, you have something valuable and meaningful to contribute to this as well. Right? So when we incorporate feedback and working with people with disabilities all the way along, that's when we start to make a difference in terms of inclusive design. Right? When we do it at the end, we're basically saying, your only value is to tell us whether we did it right or not. When we incorporate people with disabilities right from the beginning, we get to a point where we're getting that feedback. Do you remember the video player story I was telling? Right? If we had, had spoken with more people with, uh, with low vision or more people that use screen readers first about how they used video players, then we might have been in a really uh, much better position because we would have probably never taken the rewind and the fast forward button off. We probably would have had that, uh, had that information up front. When we do this, the way that it is here, we hold all the power in the relationship. We are the ones that are designing, and people with disabilities have no choice but to react to what we say. And that's a power dynamic that I hadn't really considered like three, four, five years ago. But there, there is a power dynamic in here, right? And so if we are going to include people, we have to include empowerment of, of people, right? The, the greatest power that we have as designers is to give that power away. We want people with disabilities to have that power so that they are contributing in a very meaningful way into the things that we are creating. I hope that, that it feels like, you know, that I'm, like it's a subtle nuance, but that subtle nuance makes a huge difference. So the action that I am hoping that you take from this is that you go out there and acknowledge your position, your privilege, your place, and your power that you have in the design process. Because we kind of control all of that. People engage in the design, people with disabilities or other people engage in the design process on our terms because we have said, this is when you can contribute. At this feedback time, this is when you get to contribute. No other time. One of the best questions that we could ask is, you know, working with a group of people with disabilities, how would you like, how might you like to contribute to this project? That's very different than us just saying, we'll call you in six weeks, we'll call you again in 12 weeks, you tell us if we did it right or not. So we want to acknowledge these things, and I'm, I'll start with some of my acknowledgements too. I am, I am very, very aware that I am a, a, a white dude talking about diversity and inclusive design. Uh, and, and so, like, that's it. But that's based on my 20 years of making things accessible for people with disabilities. I also know that, that that is my lens on inclusion and that there are many other lenses on inclusion. Like, when we talk about inclusion and diversity these days, most uh, organizations have, like, diversity, equality, and inclusion initiatives and things that are happening. Uh, but almost all of them are talking about gender and gender identity and, and racial diversity and sometimes even age. Um, but one of the things that we're seeing happen, inclusive design was a thing that started like in the 1960s, 70s, and that was a, a phrase that came out of, of uh, the rights of people with disabilities. It started a lot in the, in the physical space. But one of the things that we are seeing happen now is that inclusion is taking on many different meanings. And again, what is happening is when you look at any company's statements about diversity, equality, and inclusion, they almost always don't say anything about people with disabilities, where people with disabilities are being forgotten again. So I'm like, I'm putting this out there saying like, I am fully aware that there are lots of other lenses on inclusion. I just don't have a lot of experience with those. I talk about the, the accessibility for people with disabilities side of, of inclusion. And I believe that the things that I know from them can help me with those other areas of inclusion. I think they're, they all feed into one another and they're very intersectional. Um, but I'm always like looking to broaden, broaden my uh, perspectives on those things. I'm also like a 40, see what I did there? I'm not telling you how old I am. Um, I'm 40 years old. Uh, I'm Canadian, so. You know, I'm, I'm sorry. And 
I don't have any disabilities right now that have resulted in any discrimination or exclusion, uh, or at least not yet. Right? There's a point where you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen with my, with my foot, my leg. I might get to a point where I need accessible parking. I don't know. I don't know. Then I might experience some of that, some of that exclusion. Uh, and I'm also 100% willing to acknowledge and, and say for everybody, like, I've got 20 years of experience in accessibility, but I'm still learning new things every day from working directly with people with disabilities, interviewing them, talking with them. Uh, I learn new stuff all the time, and, and I love that about our field. So one of the things that I would, I would encourage you to do is to think of that shift left, and a, shift left and ask this, how can we include more people with more disabilities earlier and more meaningfully in the process? That's, I know that's a mouthful, but we really want to be thinking about that. What can we do to shift this left earlier in the process more people uh, and, and make it more meaningful so that it's not simply that usability testing at the end. So we should be doing things when we're kind of coming up with an idea for a project, like what assumptions do we have going into this that we need to verify or refute, right? And specifically about people with disabilities. What don't we know that we need to know? And then when we're doing that research, you know, if I was doing this again for that video player, we would, we would have done more research up front instead of just starting with all the data that we had gathered from doing those, those previous assessments, we would do something more like this. So we would, we would talk and observe um, people with disabilities actually using video players to find out what their pain points were. And this, literally, this should be a surprise to nobody that we would do this. But when, when it hit me that we had not done this, it was like an epiphany that it was like, it hit me with like this ridiculous weight uh, that, wow, we really, we really assumed too much and we really were, I don't wanna say arrogant, but we, we just, we were all inside our own heads, right? So these are the, the kinds of questions that if we asked them and we had done that research, we would have created a much better product. We, we would have created, maybe ended up with the exact same accessible video player, or maybe there might be slight differences, but if we had asked these questions up front, we would have embraced and used a much more inclusive process. The other thing that this leads to, uh, or the a question that we ask or can ask right up front, uh, what problems are people trying to solve and what are the opportunities here? I'm, I'm a big believer that uh, in embracing inclusive design as a process shows us a lot of opportunity for innovation, right? New ways of approaching problems. I'm gonna share a couple of examples here, here for you. Uh, I, I don't have this entire video. I encourage you to go and, and, and find this video on your own. It is a, a series on BBC called The Big Life Fix and they have uh, some, some wonderful stories of how they have worked with, with different people with disabilities to actually um, you know, solve a particular problem in their life. And, and so this, this episode was the story of Josh. Josh was eight and he was born completely blind, school-age kid, high energy, you know, was, was like a, just a wonderful boy. And he had loads of friends, but he felt like he only had friends inside the classroom because he couldn't play with them outside. Right? When he goes out into the playground, um, he, he just didn't feel like he had any friends. And so the researcher, Ruby, um, you know, starts asking him questions and he says, well, my class always goes outside, but the playground is just too big. And she's like, what do you mean, it's too big? She's like, yeah, I just can't find my friends. And so that they, they go through this process and they find that this was Josh's kind of the biggest thing that was getting in the way of him connecting with his friends is that the playground was just way too big. So they start working through a process and what they end up with uh, after many iterations is, is this. I don't know how well you can see it in this photo, but, but Josh is standing on a, a, a yellow strip and that yellow strip is a, like the tactile ground surface indicators. You see those like in airports and train stations all over the place. You see them in sidewalks sometimes as well. And there's usually two different patterns. There's like a pattern of a grid of dots and then there's like the long strips. So what they ended up doing was creating these pathways and I'll just show you a couple of other shots. You can see uh, a, a number of those strips all kind of connected to this central uh, this central hub, and we've got this overhead view. You can kind of see there's those two hubs and they're connected together, and then these pathways that go off 
uh, off of that. And one of the things that they did to make this work, and I I'm, I'm really encourage you to go and watch the video, but the, the short version is, you can see that where the dots are, where they, they're all standing right near that central hub. Um, and then the, the paths all have the lines, the longer strips moving away. What they installed underneath the dotted spot was uh, a pressure switch that played a sound. So at both ends of that strip, there would be a sound, a unique sound. So somebody could say to Josh, Josh, meet me at the moo. And they would go, and he would go around, and he would find the one that had the moo on it, and then he would know to go to the end of that to find his friends. And this was like pretty incredible, pretty life-changing for Josh. He, he, they kind of show him afterwards. And the way that it brought the whole school community together was actually really kind of amazing. So people kind of hack on things. We, we hack, we create things that we need all the time, right? That's part of innovation. Like there's a need that is not solved here. We're going to solve this problem somehow. And some of these uh, hacks I just I think are incredible. Um, one of the questions that we need to ask and that you could ask is how are people with disabilities already solving this problem, right? Uh, and, and so with that video player, we might find that people have difficulty getting uh, the, the video to play or to pause. Because to play and pause, you have to tab all the way through, find the play pause button, and then toggle it. And so maybe we, we, we know that, we, we're like, how do you solve that right now? Well, what they do is they, they um, you know, set something up so that they've, got, they've created a, an extension in their browser that has an external button that they don't have to move the focus to, and they've got that, like literally some people actually do this, they'll create a browser extension and they'll have an extra control in there that is scripted so that they can use that to toggle play and pause so they don't have to go fishing for the one that is part of the player. So we're always looking at like what, what are people already doing? And I, I, I think there's some, some really interesting uh, examples of this in the wild right now. This, this stuff has a long history. This is a, a photo from about the year 2001. Um, and you might recognize this as, a, um, as a, like a, a gaming controller. And if you take a look at these two, the, you can go and see all the, the instructions and the photos on how to build this at markbb.co.uk. And you can see what he's done. He's actually got these controllers set up so that, uh, and I don't know how well you can see it. I'm going to flip to the next screen. But you see the black tubes on the top? Um, those are all connected directly to the thing on the left. And that thing on the left is a vacuum switch. So it's like a pressure switch. So he uses that to sip and puff. So a sip. Think of taking a sip through a straw, that's like in, and a puff of air out is out. So that's like a vacuum switch based on whether he is sipped or puffed into that little black tube. So he is using those black tubes, and he's got those things wired up and, and connected into the back of the controller to control the buttons. And so what he ended up with is basically this. You can see here it's mounted kind of on his wheelchair, all these little vacuum switches on it. And he's got the joystick right underneath his chin. And he's using the sip and puff mechanism. That gives him four different buttons that he can push because he's got in and out on each one of them. So those are now his, his buttons that he's going to use to control, uh, control the game. And so we, we look at this stuff. There's a long history of, of innovation. People with disabilities do these kinds of things all the time. Everybody does. You know, we always find these innovative solutions. So. <clears throat> When Microsoft was, was doing this, uh, going through this design of this product, this is the Xbox Adaptive Controller. Uh, when they were going through the process of, of designing and creating this, this is a, a device that is designed specifically for people with disabilities, uh, particularly uh, motion and, and um, dexterity-related disabilities. When they were going through this process, they were like, what have people always done for this? Like, people are, are hacking things. How are they hacking them? How does that inform what we're about to build? Right? They looked at that body of knowledge that was already there. And, and I don't know how well you can see it. I'll just zoom in a little bit here. You can look at all of these controls, these little embossed controls on the, on the top. There are 19 controls. And so you can see here that like this is the left joystick, this is the left bumper, this is the main Xbox button, this is X1, X2, the, I don't know what that is, nor the next one, the left trigger, the right trigger. They've basically represented 
every single one of the controls, all 19 controls on an Xbox controller, they have represented those with these little switches on the back or these little jacks on the back. So what they can do, anybody has an existing switch that plugs in through these 3.5 millimeter jacks, the same one that we saw on the vacuum switch earlier. They go right in there, your existing switches, if you have switches already, they go right in, and each one of those represents, um, represents one of the controls. Uh, Microsoft is doing ridiculously fantastic work in terms of inclusive design. Uh, if you want to go, like, go to microsoft.com slash design slash inclusive, Re wonderful, wonderful resources, lots of uh, great reading material, um, lots of, of detailed, uh, detailed stuff there. Uh, this is a, a friend of mine, Bryce, Bryce Johnson. Bryce was on the team that uh, created the Xbox Adaptive Controller. And I asked him, like, what, you know, if you had to tell somebody uh, about this, like, what, what would you want gaming developers to know? He said the number one thing that he tells people is don't think of people that are specifically using this controller. He doesn't want us to design and, and build for that. He wants people to let go of the assumption that people are holding on to a controller with both hands. Right? He doesn't want people to, to be thinking and designing, what do I have to do specifically to design and build for the, the Xbox adaptive controller? XAC, they call it the ZAC. So what do I have to do to design for the ZAC? They don't, he doesn't want that. He wants people to let go of the way that they're already framing the problem. Right? Uh, and so that was like, uh, that's, that's powerful, powerful stuff. If you take a look, this is a, a young gentleman that's kind of got, he's got his two joysticks and they're all wired into the back of the ZAC. And you can see, uh, on the on the the pad in front of him, he's got these four little micro switches that are all set up. They're basically in the in the D, they're his D pad, right? His directional pad. Um, he's got the other buttons. He's got his X, his Y, and his B. And then if you look up by his head, he's got that big yellow button. That's his A button, the one that he uses the most, right? So this is all coming through and connected into into the ZAC, and it allows him to to play video games. Despite how cool this is, this is probably my favorite part of the Xbox Adaptive Controller. I'm just going to let this roll. This is the packaging for the, for the ZAC. And this is just as much of a, of a story of inclusive design as everything else. So I'm going to let this roll. One of the reasons that I love this so much is that there's some really obvious features that you might not think of until you actually start to work with people with disabilities. But some things of note, big, big loops, right? There's no little tabs that you have to pull, nothing finicky. They're all big loops so that anybody that has any use of any hand or maybe even needs a prosthetic or has a prosthetic, they can, they can uh, ultimately pull that off. Um, one of my favorite things about that entire loop is uh, about the, the video. They used gravity as one of their design materials. And you see they pull the thing off and it just like, it opens up. They, they pull, like, I mean, I mean, come on. Who did, like, what? The, the big loop, the double-sided loop on the front, the little loop falls, right? It's now more accessible and able for, uh, uh, easily and readily available for somebody to grab onto. So I, I love this. One of the most interesting things, I read an article about this, and they actually said, one of their goals, they, they did a whole bunch of inclusive design work trying to figure out what the problems were that, that people were always having with packaging. And they said the number one thing that they saw people doing was uh, people particularly with mobility and dexterity challenges. I, I think you know, I do this too, but they couldn't get the packaging open, so what are they doing? They're using their teeth, right? Like who, hands up if you've used your teeth to open a package, right? Like that's, that's everybody, right? Almost everybody, except for my, my uh, grandfather. He ended up not having any teeth at the end, but he couldn't, <laughs> couldn't do it. But I, sometimes I don't know why I tell you certain things. Um, but but they, they actually said 
We want to design a teeth-free packaging experience. They literally said that. Like, how brilliant is that? Right? They only figured that out by actually working with and talking with people with disabilities. Uh, another, this is a, an engineer, a young engineer from, uh, from Microsoft, and uh, she was using Skype all the time to connect. She was um, in the US, and she was connecting to her family back in India, and she's deaf, and, and she reads lips. And one of the things that she said she really had a lot of problems with was she was always asking her parents to like turn down the you know like turn down the lights or close the curtains to make it darker because it was so bright she was having trouble reading their lips, and and so what she said was like this is kind of silly we should we should be able to use software to do this so you know that in Skype uh, if you use Skype there's that blur the background feature that blur and darken the background feature is actually comes from her like she created this for herself. Um, as a need, and then they, they rolled that out. I'm, I'm really kind of you know, going quickly through that, but that's, that's kind of the bottom line. Um, another, uh, uh, I think, a really good example of somebody that has kind of embraced the, the ideas of inclusive design and not like, we're doing this only because it's a legal requirement, right? This is a, a, a boarding pass for uh, a flight through the Vancouver Airport in Canada. And you can see the little sticker on there, YVR CAN. Um, and the, the program was called, or this initiative was called I Can Fly. And it was designed specifically for people with autism or children, uh, parents that have children with autism, to help them on their, uh, with the flight experience. The, fly, the experience of flying can be difficult for many people, but particularly difficult for people with autism. And so they created this, this set of checklists for people with autism to be able to kind of go through this experience. And I'll, I'll go through this quickly. You know, going to the gate, check your gate number. If you need help, ask for information, walk to the gate, all done. They're all using like little pictograms that are very common for, for people with autism and other, um, th this pictographic language that many people use that, that don't have the ability to speak. So at the gate, wait for your turn to board. Uh, choose an activity while you wait, listen for your turn to board all done. Take off, listen to announcements, put your trade table up, put away your phone, tablet, or laptop, seat is up nice and straight, all done. Airplane ride, choose an activity, ask before going to the toilet. The bathroom is very small and makes a very loud flush noise. You can cover your ears if you want, all done. Right? Really sets an expectation for what is this experience going to be like so that it's easier for that person with autism to, to kind of react to. My favorite piece in all of it is the smiley face at the end. There's an explicit all done with a smiley face. Like, I want to do this for my checklist of things to do every day, right? Like, I'm all done, I get a happy face now, this is good. But I love it because it's an explicit thing. There's no computation. Do I have to look through the list to see if there's anything left over? It's a specific accomplishment, like this is all done and we're good with it, right? So lots of things to, to think about and some important lessons in here. We need to start earlier. We know way less than we think, and other people know more than we think. So when we look at this and, and try to figure out how do we improve this, we've, we've talked about a few different things here that are process related. How do we actually go about doing this? Um, we're gonna do this really, really quickly here. Um, this is a, a game called Twister. Uh, if you're not familiar with Twister, you're maybe better off for that, I don't know, but this is a game where you basically, you would have a little spinner, and it would, and the, the spinner is like this, so it would, you would spin, there's a little needle on there, and you spin it, and it goes around, and it would land on a color, and then one of these uh, appendages, left foot, right foot, left hand, right hand. So you've, if you got to the point where it said left hand red, you would need to put your left hand down on the red one, the next person goes, they put their right foot on green or whatever it is, and we usually end up in a position where people are in all these really contorted positions, and it, it's twister and people fall down and it's fun and they laugh, and it was like first invented in the 1950s and don't look at those commercials because they're really creepy. <laughs> um, 
now that I've said it, you're all going to go and look, I know, but just hold on for a little bit. So ultimately, we're going to do a, a really quick thing here. We're going to do this hands-on, and we're going to do this in 90 seconds. I usually do this as a, like, a full-day inclusive design workshop, and we take like an hour to do this or more. We're going to do this in 90 seconds, because I want to see um, how quickly you can work. And you're, you're totally up for this. I can tell by the looks on your faces you're ready for this. So what we want to do is create an accessible game of Twister that anyone can play. We're going to identify a barrier to participation for someone that has uh, you know, difficulty seeing. Maybe they are completely blind or have low vision. Uh, someone that can't hear uh, or is hard of hearing, has dexterity-related issues, mobility-related issues, speech, memory, or language-related issues. And then we're going to try and figure out one or two ways that we can eliminate that barrier to increase participation. So difference between mobility and dexterity. Dexterity is like fine motor control and fine motor movements. Mobility is, so that might be somebody that, that has a, a tremor or something like that. It might be very difficult for them to, to spin the thing. Um, mobility is more like somebody is, you know, uses crutches all the time or they use a scooter or a wheelchair. That might be an example of mobility. So their mobility and dexterity are different. Uh, we're all feeling, feeling ready? You think you can do this? I think you, I'm not looking at all of you. I'm literally, I saw you and you nodded your head yes. So I think we're good to go. Um, so even if you're not ready, we're gonna do this anyway. So you literally have 90 seconds to come up with one or two barriers to participation in the game and a way to get around that barrier. Not get around it, but so let's, I'll give you an example. Dexterity, somebody might not be able to spin the thing, right, the, the spinner. So we might actually have an app that, and you, you know, like they might have an app that does the spin for you. So instead of having to spin, you could just tap on the screen, which takes a lot less dexterity than, than flicking the spinner. Make sense? And you're, just so you're aware, you can't use that one. That's like, <laughs> that's my gift to you. All right, go ahead, you have 90 seconds. We'll do this really, really fast. You're allowed to talk with each other too. You, don't, you could do it in pairs. It's not gonna feel really awkward if you're quiet the whole time. You have 62 seconds left. Twenty seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, a half, quarter. An eighth, can you tell I have children? <laughs> All right, so normally we would do that over a much greater period of time, but we're gonna go really, really quick on this. Can somebody, uh, and I'm gonna come to you because you were like the one that started it all, I hope that's okay. Um, what, what, was the, what was a barrier, and I'll repeat it so that everybody can hear, but what was a, a barrier that you thought of and what did you do to try and uh, alleviate that barrier? Okay. And so we both thought, well, if you can't see color, you could do um, different shapes. And I thought, well, we could also add texture to the game. And different textures would be shapes. Awesome. So we both thought Awesome. So I'll just repeat that really quickly. So uh, they were talking about blindness and color blindness. If you can't see color, then we can use shape. As, a, as an indicator, so it might not just be everything in circles, we might have different shapes, and then we might add some texture to that as well. 
Awesome. Uh, somebody from, from this side, anybody like volunteer or, or is this like, uh, you're okay, I'm gonna move over to this side. Anybody over here? Anyone over here wanna share? If you don't wanna share, that's totally fine. I'm like, oh, at the back. This is a long way away. This could be tough, but let's go for it. Awesome. Mm. So if you, if you had some, some challenges with seeing, we might incorporate some sound into it so that there might be different tones for, to indicate like that this is you know, left hand, right hand, uh, left foot, right foot, or whatever. Um, one, one more, I'm gonna come back to this side. You got another shot, here we go. Yeah, so the body labels are like left foot, right foot, left hand, right hand. What about somebody playing that doesn't have hands, right? Like that happens, right? Somebody may not have legs. So could we make those things more generic so that, uh, that, that people would feel like, yeah, I can play this game, right? So maybe it's just like, you know, some left side of your body part. I don't even know what that was, horrible English, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, so. All, we, we could do this and we would come up with some great things. We've, we've talked before, people have said, you know, for somebody that's in a wheelchair uh, or on a mobility scooter, what if we made the board so that it's not just flat on the ground, but that it actually goes up the wall partly too, right? So that somebody that's sitting in a wheelchair, could, they could reach it that way. And I'm like, you people are super smart. Uh, and, and like, you all came up with great things and I'm, I wish we could go through, but we would never get out of here if we went through everybody's uh, contributions. But that right there, what we did, that was kind of inclusive design thinking. We're thinking about it, right? But we haven't done a whole lot of inclusion of people with disabilities in that. Now, you know, one caveat on that, some people in the room have different disabilities and so you may have contributed that, right? And you're thinking from that perspective about something very specific. But I can pretty much guarantee that there's nobody in the room that has every single one of those or some form of every single one of those disabilities, right? So even though you might have been thinking about your own disability, even if you're, if you're a designer with a disability, that's not the only disability you want to be thinking of, right? We want to be thinking about everybody. So, so that was kind of inclusive design thinking. And to move that into um, an actual inclusive design practice, we need to take those ideas, we need to kind of throw those ideas around, involve people with disabilities in that discussion. So for the three of you that were having discussions, or groups of four, or two, or whatever it was, we should actually be talking with a bunch of people with different disabilities to find out how they might like to play, right? So. That's the, the idea here, uh, taking things from inclusive design thinking to getting to a point where we're working with people with disabilities as actual co-designers, as co-creators. And one word that I need to highlight in here, people, that is plural, right? Two really quick things that I, I, I want to, uh, to, to mention here, people say this to me all the time, like Derek, honestly, we aren't excluding people intentionally. And my response to that is almost always, you're right, but you're not including people intentionally either. Right? We have to be intentional about this. And so these are, are a couple of tools that, that we use when we're examining people's practices. This is a, a tool inventory, and we basically create this grid to kind of start thinking about do the tools that we use and the processes and methods that we use in design did they actually allow people with disabilities to participate, right? Do they? So we wanna to get to this point where we are um, making things uh, more inclusive and how do we improve on the, the last project that we did. Uh, on the developer side, we think about, I'm, I'm saying this because we get stuck in these little traps. Uh, most people, when they're developing, if they look at this and they look at these color swatches on the right-hand side, they're gonna look at those and they're like, cool, you can only choose one of those at any given time, so we're gonna make it a radio button underneath the hood and then we're just gonna use some CSS to make it look like these color swatches. The problem with that is when a sighted, uh, like a screen reader user and they hear that they're radio buttons and they hear that they're colors, no problem, they can use that. But a sighted keyboard user looks at that and there is absolutely nothing that tells them how to operate that. If you were to move from one color to another, you would probably hit the tab key. And the reality is if you code it as radio buttons, you've hit tab to focus on the first one, and then you need to use the arrow keys to move through, 
right? So we need to kind of think a little bit differently about how we're approaching, uh, approaching problems. If, if these are radio buttons, they need to have affordances that visually show people this is how you operate these things. So we want to think beyond what we know. And I'm going to leave you with these kind of goals for inclusion. These are, are um, I, I think these are really important and fundamental to everything we do. Uh, participation, so you should have the ability and opportunity to participate in the solutions that you will use and that will have an impact on your life, right? Value, your participation in a process is valued rather than tolerated or accommodated. Right? Accommodated is one of my least favorite words in the world because it's like, okay, I guess we'll do that, right? It's the thing that we do when we don't make it accessible or inclusive in the first place, we have to accommodate. If we make it so that it's inclusive from the beginning, we don't have to accommodate, we just include by default. And then the last one, belonging and othering. Your participation should be predicated on using the same tools at the same time, in the same space, using the same process as anyone to the greatest extent possible. That's one of the number one reasons when I ask you to raise your hands and say I, it's because some people in here, I have no idea, somebody in here might be blind. They can't see. Or they're sitting at the front and they can't, they can't see all the hands going up behind them. So when we raise our hands and say I at exactly the same time, everybody gets, the same, uh, gets that feedback at the same time. Right? Same tools, same space, same place, same process. So I hope that that makes sense to you. We want to make sure that we're not uh, getting people feeling like they are uh, being othered, right? We don't want to single people out. And then the last thing that I, I would love for you to do, and this is a, a question that I will ask, and I would love for you to tweet this at me. I'm, I'm Feather on Twitter. If you want to engage or send me a DM, I would love your ideas on this. I have my ideas on this, but how do we measure inclusion is one of the most important questions that I think we can ask because that will allow us to show that we are getting better at this over time. So if you have any questions about any of this, I would love to talk with you about it. Uh, again, I'm Derek Featherstone. I'm Feather on Twitter. I really, really thank you for your time today. Uh, you've been a, a wonderful audience. Thank you.